Hey, I'm Jesse. Let's have a devotion. We're in Matthew chapter 9, verses 18 through 26, tells the story of a miracle framing a miracle. Yesterday, we looked at particularly the miracle within the miracle. That is the woman who was healed of her internal bleeding. And today, we're going to talk about the miracle that surrounds that miracle. And then tomorrow, we'll kind of wrap all these up by looking at, at the Mark account and the Luke account of the exact same miracle, because they all they all work together to paint this beautiful picture. Mark chapter 5, verses 21 through 43 tells this story. Luke chapter 8, verses 40 through 56 tells the same story. Mark uh, gives a longer rendering of this event than Matthew does, which is unusual. Usually Mark was more punchy and to the point, but Matthew is in the middle of a rapid fire series of miracles. Remember also that Matthew's gospel does not move chronologically. So the the text of Matthew we've read twice already. Here is here's the text of Mark's gospel, telling the story of the of the healing within the healing. All right, the 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 miraculous healing really within the work of resurrection. Here's Mark chapter five verse twenty one. When Jesus had crossed over again by boat to the other side, a large crowd gathered around him while he was by the sea. One of the synagogue leaders named Jairus came, and when he saw Jesus, fell at his feet and begged him earnestly, My little daughter is dying. Come and lay your hands on her so that she can get well and live. So in Mark's gospel account, this young girl has not yet died. She's also, also it turns out that she's, she's 12 years old, according to Luke's gospel, Luke chapter 8, verse 42. Uh, and so this woman, uh, this is verse 25 of Mark 5, now a woman suffering from bleeding for 12 years had endured much under many doctors. She had spent everything she had and was not helped at all. On the contrary, she became worse. So a couple of things. For one, when we, when we look at Mark chapter 5 and Luke chapter 8, we learn that Jairus, the synagogue leader's daughter, we didn't learn Jairus' name in the Matthew account. Jairus is named in Mark's gospel, but his daughter has been alive for as long as this woman has been suffering. So the chronology of the healing might seem as though Jesus is delaying in healing Jairus' daughter or resurrecting Jairus' daughter, as the story would ultimately tell. But the truth is that this woman had actually been suffering for longer. As long as Jairus' daughter had been alive, this woman had been afflicted by an internal bleeding issue. So the chronology of Jesus' healings is actually quite perfect. Moreover, it's prompted by the woman reaching through the crowd to touch the ceremonial hem of Jesus' garment. Moreover, Luke's gospel is way kinder to the physicians than Mark's was. In Mark's gospel, we just heard verse 26, how she'd spent all of her money. The doctors only made things worse. Here's Luke chapter 8, uh, Luke chapter 8, verse 43. A woman suffering from bleeding for 12 years who had spent all she had on doctors and yet could not be helped by any approached from behind and touched the end of his robe. Instantly, her bleeding stopped. So we see Mark giving all the action points and we see Luke, a fellow physician, being more sympathetic to his colleagues, his fellow practitioners. Verse 27 of the Mark 5 account of the same miracle, having heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his clothing. For she said, if I could just touch his clothes, I'll be made well. We see that that coincides with Matthew chapter 9, verse 21. Instantly, her flow of blood ceased and she sensed in her body that she was healed of her affliction. It's really remarkable that Mark's gospel is, is embellishing in greater detail here than Matthew's. Uh, and uh, and it, it even goes on longer than Luke's. Luke was really the more verbose one. He was writing to a Roman audience of Theophilus. Mark was really more to the point and action-oriented. Matthew was the one who was writing uh, to, to Jewish readers. So it could be that this is this is happening in Gentile territory, and for that reason, there's less of a you know there's there's less of an emphasis on it. But even then, it's the story of Jairus, uh, the synagogue leader's daughter, who's being resurrected here. This woman, for as long as Jairus' daughter has been alive, has been like, uh, she's, if she goes to the temple, she does so secretly because she was rendered ceremonially unclean by an affliction that was beyond her capacity to control. Moreover, the, the action around the scene is, is, is uh, illustrated more clearly 
when we see Luke's account. So in verse 45 of Luke 8, Who touched me? Jesus asked. When they all denied it, Peter said, Master, the crowds are hemming you in and pressed against you. Someone did touch me, said Jesus. I know that power has gone out from me. All right, that's Luke 8, verse 46. This is different as well from uh, the, way that the, uh, the way that Mark's gospel's uh, account describes it. It shows, shows that he just sensed that the power had gone out from him, right? Uh, he knew that power had, had, had flowed from him, so he knew, that, he knew that someone had been healed. And so uh, Peter, ever the spokesman for the disciples, asked that question, Master, the crowds are hemming you in as, as, and, press, and pressing against you. It, it's, it's genuinely funny when you see it playing it out in your head. Uh, the synagogue leader has come to Jesus. He was just there answering a question asked by John the Baptist's disciples. And then now he's rushed with urgency to Jairus' house. Because upon the initial report, according to Mark and Luke, the little girl is dying. In Matthew's gospel, which is the much more succinct version, she's already dead. And he's asking for a resurrection. Now... This massive crowd of people, everybody piling in, including these two, uh, these these blind and mute men, are, are actually are, are going to show up later on in the very next text in Matthew's gospel. They're all piling in, and everybody's just shoulder to shoulder with people. If you've been to Disney World, think Main Street, USA, right before the fireworks, and that's Jesus going through. And then Jesus is like, "Stop! Somebody touched me," and you can see like Peter's confusion. All of us have. Like, everybody's touching everybody right now. I'm currently in contact with seven different people. I can feel it, and it's gross. And the other hasn't been invented yet. Why would you ask this? So Peter, ever the spokesman, asks this question. Master, the, 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 the crowds are hemming you, hemming you in and pressing against you. Jesus insists, because he knows. He's the truth, right? Someone did touch me, said Jesus. I know that power has gone out from me. When the woman saw that she was discovered, this is Luke 8, 47, she came trembling and fell down before him. In the presence of all the people, she declared the reason she had touched him and how she was instantly healed. Daughter, he said to her, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. So the Luke account of the same gospel, uh, of the same event, gives us even more precious verbiage. We saw yesterday in, Ma in Matthew 9, 22, have courage, daughter, your faith has saved you. And then the Luke 8 account, the same miracle, it also includes the words, go in peace. Go in peace indeed. She has encountered the living Jesus. It was probably petrifying for her to be called out publicly like this. But it's a beautiful testimony. Now this brings us back to Jairus' daughter. Again, we don't know the name Jairus if we zoom in only on Matthew's gospel. Jairus is a name that is, that is given to us uh, by the other gospel accounts, All right? And so, uh, and, and particularly Mark chapter five. So, listen to Luke's account. Now that we go to Jairus's house, this is Luke eight verse forty nine. While he was still speaking, someone came from the synagogue leader's house and said, "Your daughter is dead. Don't bother the teacher anymore." This deviates slightly from what we heard before in Matthew's more succinct account. We're already, we're already given away the ending. It's already spoiled. The, the ending is spoiled in, in Matthew's account because she's already she's described as dead before the whole thing begins, which means that the father's asking for resurrection. That's something I've asked God for. But in Luke's more detailed account, it's revealed that actually this 12-year-old girl, uh, almost a woman, almost about, about to go through what would later be called a bat mitzvah, right? Her transition into adulthood, uh, that she is dying. She is not yet, she's not yet dead. But now at this point, the two narratives overlap. And this guy's Jairus' friends are telling him, look, don't bother him anymore. She's already died. But then verse 50 changes things. When Jesus heard it, he answered him, don't be afraid, only believe, and she will be saved. That's Luke 8.50. After he came to the house, he let no one enter with him except Peter, John, James, and the child's father and mother. Everyone was crying and mourning for her. But he said, stop crying, because she is not dead, but asleep. They laughed at him, because they knew she was dead. Now, who were, who were they, according to chapter, uh, verse 53? That would be 
Peter, John, James, and the child's father and mother. I doubt that the father laughed here. I doubt that the mother laughed here, but that could very well be Jesus' own disciples that laughed. All right, we don't get that detail in the more succinct account in Matthew. They laughed at him because they knew she, she was dead. So he took her by the hand and called out, Child, get up. In the Matthew 9 account, the words aren't, in, aren't, aren't included. Moreover, in Mark's account, the exact wording is given, Talitha Kaum, which just translated a little girl, I say to you, get up. We'll look at Mark's account tomorrow. But for now, back to Luke's, child, get up. That's Luke 8, verse 54. Her spirit returned, and she got up at once. Then he gave orders that she be given something to eat. This is, I, I'm telling you, man, I got a whole theology about food. Eating is a big deal to God. <laughs> the first order of business when he you know, resurrects with his disciples to prove to him that he's really alive is to eat a piece of broiled fish. When he reconciles with Peter on the beach, they, they do so over a meal. And when we're told to remember him, it's with a meal. And then when all of heaven is celebrated at the marriage supper, it's a meal. Right? And like it's all, it's all about food, man. Food is a big deal to God, I'm telling you. And so he gives orders right away. Give this girl something to eat. Verse 56, her parents were astounded but he instructed them to tell no one what had happened. It's at this point in Jesus' ministry that the time had not yet come. The time had not yet come. It was not yet time for everybody to know um, about Jesus. The crucifixion would happen, but not yet. And so this is, this is one of those moments when Jesus would tell them to be to be hush-hush about it. Tomorrow, we'll go through Mark's Gospel's account, the exact same, the exact same miracle. Uh, but for now, I want to zoom in further on the, on the, on the, the greater em embellishment of the story about Jairus and his daughter. Um, Jairus is the leader of the synagogue, and he's down at Jesus' feet. That's a huge deal. Uh, and if you, look, if you go through the Matthew Gospel account, he's asking for a resurrection. If you go through the Mark and Luke accounts, he's asking for a miraculous healing, but he then goes on to receive a resurrection later on in the text. And there's this picture of salvation that we are all as good as dead. You might not think we're dead now because I'm talking to you and you're watching this video, but we're all dead in our sin. And then what Jesus speaks is so exquisite. Don't be afraid, only believe and she will be saved. See the parallels between this miracle and salvation. I would argue that salvation is a greater miracle even than this work of resurrection. Because this resurrected girl would later die anyway. She would go on one day to pass away, just like Lazarus would one day go on to pass away. Just like the, the, one, the boy resurrected by Elisha would one day pass away. Every one of the resurrections that would take place in the text for anybody but Jesus in the Bible was temporary. But the resurrection that lasts forever the resurrection of Jesus in which we all share in salvation. And this resurrection, I believe, doesn't just give us an, a miraculous account of Jesus' lordship, but it paints a picture of what happens when we likewise are saved. He says to her, Talitha Kaum, which means get up. Same words, get up. Punctuate the miracles of the book of Acts. It's crazy. Telling people to get up. Jesus, when he heals the, the man, the, the paralytic, lowered down on a mat, get up, pick up your mat, and walk. Get up. It's this picture uh, in those healings of our repentance. Our faith is completed by what we do. It's accompanied by action. We turn from our sin because we are saved. And if a faith has no action, no such deed accompanying it, it's a useless faith. It's a dead faith. These miracles are punctuated by this calling to get up, both here and in the Acts accounts. And I think that they are, they are analogous to the salvation moment. As the woman healed of, her, healed of her internal bleeding, was told, take courage, my daughter, right? Your faith has healed you. And then in the Luke account, go in peace. All the power in the story is Jesus's. My Calvinist friend, I know that sometimes you'll, you'll harangue non-Calvinist, by the way, not everybody who's not a Calvinist is an Arminian, for claiming that they did something to save themselves, when really what they did was they believed. And that's all that's required biblically. Whoever believes in the Son has life. Whoever does not believe in the Son does not have life, for God's wrath 
remains on him. James, in chapter 2 of his epistle, goes to great length to emphasize the critical difference between faith and deeds. They are different. They are fundamentally different. What this woman did is reach out and touch his, his garment. What Jesus says to her is, your faith has healed you. But the power in the story is 100% that of Jesus. And the whole thing was foreknown and foreordained by God. It's in the biblical narrative in three of the four Gospels so that you would hear about it. And not just so that you would say, oh, wow, that's nice but so that you would be healed yourself, that you would believe that Jesus is Lord, that you likewise would believe and be saved. All right, that's uh, Luke chapter 8, verse 50. Believe and be saved. Don't be afraid, only believe and she will be saved. Kaum, get up, repent from sin, believe today. That is the greater miracle and that is the purpose of these two miracles now chronicled in three gospel accounts.